Our gospel lesson is the story of the epiphany, the visit of the Magi, and it comes to us from Matthew's gospel, the second chapter, the first 12 verses. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star is rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you have a working knowledge of quantum mechanics, you will know who Schrodinger's cat was. Forget that. Nobody's got a working knowledge of quantum mechanics, I'm guessing, here. Anybody here? Raise your hand in the back. Nobody does. But I'm telling you what, if you watch The Big Bang Theory, you know about Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger was a physicist. He was the theoretical guy, and he never put a cat in a box. Don't worry. He never did this. This was all talk. This was all conjecture. This was all theory. This is what he and Einstein and the other brilliant minds did when they sat around having a beer at night. This is what they talk about. Schrodinger's cat is the idea that if you take a cat and you put it in a box with something dangerous, in this case, some sort of atom that was going to do something to the cat, possibly, that it might kill the cat if the cat did something to open the vial, that it was, eh, you know, it was all this kind of stuff. Really what it comes down to is until anybody opened the box and saw whether the cat was alive or dead, that theoretically that the cat was both alive and dead at the same time. That's Schrodinger's cat. Created a lot of hubbub in the day. Now you could say the same thing, say the same thing. I've got to talk here. I've got a cough drop in my mouth because I'm having some voice trouble, so sorry about that. You could say the same thing about an unwrapped gift, couldn't you? Can we go back to that, that sermon slide there for a moment and look at that beautiful present? Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? And as long as it stays under wraps, as long as it's wrapped, then it's simultaneously either the best gift you've ever received or something you really don't want or need, right? That's the trouble with an unwrapped gift, isn't it? You come down on Christmas morning and you see it there, or on your birthday someone hands you a package and you're so excited because the whole world of possibilities is there. It could be something so great. Maybe not a car with a bow on top, but maybe the keys to a car. Or it could be socks and underwear or something like that that nobody really likes to get, but we all could use. Gifts are interesting, aren't they? We just finished the season of gift giving, and I went online to order something because my television exploded in my bedroom and I needed a new TV. And online now, when you order a television, you can order one that is an open box television for a lot less money. That means someone received it for Christmas, didn't want it, put it back in the box and sent it back to Amazon or whoever they got it from. Because lots of times people want to return the gifts they don't particularly like or want or need. And we're into this business now where you just sort of exchange gift cards. It's just like handing everybody money. But we're going to look at the specific gifts today that were given in the lessons that we read. Not just the lesson of the Magi, but the other lessons as well. But first, I want to tell you a story about a gift that I received years ago, over 40 years ago now. And I certainly still remember getting this gift. I was working at the movie theater in Timonium that is no longer there. They tore it down. That's how long ago it was. And one of my friends who worked on staff with me, we weren't all that close, but she said, I got you something for Christmas this year. 
And I thought, oh great, another present that I have to buy. I had three jobs working my way through college. I didn't have a lot of money. And so the day came when we exchanged gifts, and they were wrapped beautifully. She handed me hers, and I handed her mine. I opened hers up, and it was a beautiful glass Mikasa tray with flowers on it. Beautiful. I still have it. I still think of her every time I use it. And I sat there in dread as she opened my gift, because the look on her face, she tried to hide her disappointment, but I gave her the dreaded Lifesaver book five rolls of lifesavers on two sides folded into a book. Not a great present, huh? So what does a present say, both about the person giving it and the person who is the recipient of the gift? What did it say about me? It could have said, well, I'm just too poor and I don't have much time. But what it really said was I didn't care that much about this person. And her gift to me said she cared so much about me that she wanted to do something wonderful for me. And she was in college, too, so she had the same sort of bills that I had to pay. But she took time and took her resources and used them to buy me something beautiful. Let me tell you what, every time I have used that tray for 40 years, I still feel this stab of guilt in my heart. And at my dad's funeral back in September, this lady's mom came to visit with my mother. And the first thing I thought when I saw her was, there's Lisa's mother. Oh no, I gave her a lifesaver book and she gave me this beautiful tray. Well, look at the gifts in the story of the Magi this morning, the gifts that they bring, gold and frankincense and myrrh. What do they say about the men giving the gifts or the women? Because I said there are scholars who believe that women could have been part of that traveling ensemble of star studiers from the East, from the different countries of the world. What does it say about them and what does it say about Jesus who is receiving these gifts. It says a lot. Now, there's a hint in what they think of him because they go to Herod. Even though they followed the star and the star doesn't stop in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem and Bethlehem are very close, like Cockeysville, Timonium, close. But they don't go to where the star is because they see this palace where the king is. And they go there and they say to him, we are here looking for the king whose star rose in the sky so that we might worship him. Now Herod was pretty amazed at that because Herod thought he was the only king in town. And if anyone was going to receive beautiful, wonderful gifts and homage and worship, it should be him. But he doesn't even know when his own Messiah is expected and where he will be born. And what do the gifts themselves say about who this is? Gold. Now remember last week how we talked about when Mary and Joseph went to the temple with the baby Jesus 33 days after he was born for Mary's purification ritual. They gave the gift of poor people, two turtle doves, two pigeons as a sacrifice. They couldn't afford any sort of lamb or goat or a kid. They couldn't afford that, so they gave the gift of poor people. And here they're receiving gold. What does gold say? Gold was something that was held by people of great value or a king. That's a kingly gift. Frankincense. Now I have some frankincense in my office and sometimes I'll bring it out and I'll let the little kids have a sniff of it. You know what I use it for? I use it for mosquito repellent when I go to the Adirondacks on my picture taking retreat every summer. But in the days of old, frankincense was very valuable and it was the gift that you gave to a god. If you remember John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, when he went into the temple, it was his turn to take the frankincense and make the offering to God. Myrrh. Now that's a really difficult one to look at because myrrh was used to embalm a body, to prepare a body for burial. Who would give such a gift to a baby? Now I said sometimes the pictures get it wrong and the songs get it wrong. We three kings of Orient are... Well, they're not necessarily three, they're not necessarily kings, they're not necessarily traveling from the Orient, per se. But part of that song gets it exactly right. What does it say about the gifts? Glorious now behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. The king who receives the gold, the God who receives the frankincense is the sweet smell offering of the people. Sacrifice. 
Jesus who would die on the cross for our sins, who would need myrrh to anoint his body for burial. Those gifts say a lot about who he is, not just who he was, who he is for us, king and God and sacrifice. It says a lot, too, about those men who came to give him those gifts, those magi. It says a tremendous amount about them. They were not Jewish. First and foremost, they were not Jewish. They were studiers of the stars, which is really sort of frowned upon in Scripture, even condemned in several places in the Old Testament. Divination is not something that you try to do. You don't try to look at the night sky or the stars or tea leaves or tarot cards or anything else and try to figure out what's going to happen in the future because the future is God's domain. But even these foreigners with their strange practices and their own gods recognized what Christ's own people of the day could not, was that he had come into the world and everything was going to change because of that. He was the gift. He was the star. Elaine was absolutely right in her song. He was the star in the desert, the light in the sky, the light for all people, the light that shines in darkness, the light that no darkness can overcome. This is who Christ is. And strangers, foreigners, were the only people who could understand it. It says a lot about King Herod as well. He's so threatened by the thought of another king, one who will shepherd my people Israel. I've said before that in the ancient Near East, the image of a shepherd was a kingly image. And we read in this morning's psalm, which was our call to worship, about how this was a king who was going to keep us from violence and oppression, the king who was going to watch out for us, the king who was going to serve us, the king who was going to care for us, because we were precious to this king. That is who was coming, and that is exactly who Herod was not. He didn't care about his people He only cared to keep Rome satisfied so that he could occupy the place that he had in the palace. He went along to get along. And he was so intimidated by the thought of another king coming, so unfamiliar with his own people's scriptures that he had to ask people, where is this child to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for as it is written in the prophet, you, Bethlehem, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come the one who will shepherd my people, Israel. And he is so horrified at the thought that, that someone else could possibly steal his grandeur that he orders the execution of babies, baby boys two years and under. It's also part of the reason that we know how long it took them to arrive, these visitors from the east. But those weren't the only gifts that were mentioned in Scripture today, were they? Paul talks about the gift of grace that was given to him. The gift of grace. Grace is God's unfailing, undeserved, unmerited love given to us, poured into our hearts that makes us whole. That's what saves us. It's not our acceptance of Christ. It's not about us. It's about what Christ has done for us that calls forth a response of acceptance. But make no mistake, it is Christ alone who saves. And the grace that he has given to Paul is something strange too. Because just as Matthew's gospel focuses on the Jewish population. Matthew's gospel, more than any other of the gospels, more than Mark, Luke, or John, is the gospel that reveals that this is the one promise to the Jewish people. In fact, it begins at chapter 1 with the genealogy of Jesus. It doesn't go back like Luke's does to Adam, son of Adam, son of God. It starts with Abraham. Abraham through David, through Joseph, Mary's husband, to Jesus the son born in Bethlehem. And if Matthew can recognize that it's the Gentiles who are coming to pay him homage, they're the ones who are getting it. It opens up that world that says that, yes, this was the Messiah promised to the Jewish people, but he is going to be revealed, unwrapped, uncovered for all people around the world, all times, all places. It's a little ironic, isn't it, that Matthew is the one who says very clearly, who this child is going to be for the world. And then Paul comes along and says, the gift that God has given to me is to reveal Jesus Christ to the nations, to the Gentiles. He's going to take that word specifically to the people outside of the Jewish community. He's going to travel around the Mediterranean. He's going to baptize Lydia. He's going to preach. He's going to go to Athens. He's going to confront all those gods and goddesses and their statues and their grandeur, and he's going to explain to them who Christ is for the world. 
And because of that message, we are here worshiping today, whether it's at home, sitting at our kitchen table, or here in this beautiful sanctuary. Wherever we are, we are the church. Ah, ha, ha, we're the church. We're the gift of the world. We're Christ's body. He is living in and through us now. And if we want to make him known to the world, we have to continue to unwrap the gift for others. We have to continue to take him into the world. We have to be the gift that keeps on giving in Jesus Christ, who lives in and through us in our ministries. So many people are so tired of waiting. So many people have given up hope in God's promises because Christ hasn't returned. But God, Emmanuel, is with us, in us, living through us to bring hope and healing to the world until the time of his return. And he is going to come back because he told us he would. But until then, we have what we need to serve him. We have what we need to worship him. We have all that we need, but we have to unwrap it. Think back to that beautiful package all wrapped up. What good would it do if you put it in your closet and never opened it? It still might be something wonderful and beautiful, might be something you don't like all that much, but you'll never know without unwrapping it and showing it to the world. We have to do that with Jesus Christ. We have to get him out from under wraps. Now, that's not, a, that's not an image that comes from gift wrap. It comes from horse racing of all places. Under wraps was when a jockey or the rider would wrap the, the rein around his hands and hold it tight to keep the horse from fully running, to hide its might and its power until the time came when you really wanted to charge ahead. That's what under wraps really means. But for us, we need to show the world who Christ is fully. We need to let God out of the box because God is not just here in this sanctuary, as beautiful as it is. And if we want to worship God fully, we have to bring our best to God every day, the best that we have to offer. Because what we give of ourselves shows what we think of the one who we are worshiping. Worship is a wonderful opportunity whether it's on Sunday, to come together, no matter how we come together, to put aside our own self-interest. Not to be like Herod and think, what am I going to get out of this? But to say, what am I bringing to God? Why am I here? What am I pouring out of my heart in praise and adoration? What am I doing to thank God for all the blessings that I have received? That is something that we need to take from Sunday and take from this building and spread around to every moment of our lives till we can every day Stop and give God the glory for all that we have received, for the gift of Jesus Christ that comes to us, that heals us, that saves us, that makes us new, that calls forth that response of praise, that response of service, that response of love, not just for each other, but for all the world, regardless of anyone's skin color, regardless of anyone's background or accent, regardless of what they may have believed before, to show them that Christ is the light for all the nations. It's not about getting the wealth of the nations to come to us. It's not about those camels coming. It's not about the gifts, the abundance of the sea. It's not about the gold or the frankincense and even the myrrh. It's about offering to Christ what we have and offering Christ to others. That is the gift that God has entrusted to us. And if we continually unwrap and reveal the God of love to the world. The world will know who Christ is, not to give us glory. It's not about what we do right or wrong, but it's about the one who has come to be the light of the world. Jesus is going to say later when he grows up, he's going to gather his disciples together on that hillside. He's going to say to them and to us, you are the light of the world. Who lights a light and puts it under a bushel basket? Instead, you put it on the lampstand so that everyone see. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are called to reflect that light. We are called to share that light. But first, we have to be like those wise men and recognize who he is. And maybe like them, we have to go home by a new road. We have to change the way we've done things up until now. We have to go home believing and rejoicing and sharing and proclaiming who Christ is. The Savior of the world has come, the greatest gift you will ever receive. Don't put it on a shelf. Don't try to exchange it for something better. There's nothing better. Don't regift it to the extent that you give it all away, but share it with everyone you meet. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>